delicate touch, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah touch. It, it's much more delicate than it looks like here. Oh, I believe it. <laughs> Here we are, August 7th, 1997. ABS Global in DeForest, Wisconsin has just announced the successful cloning of three bull calves. And there's one of them, Gene. 1998. Here in a U.S. Department of Agriculture laboratory, they're using a new gene gun to permanently change the gene code that makes a barley plant. 2003, automated laboratories around the world successfully completed the most ambitious biological project of all time, the complete sequencing of the human genome. In 2004, here in a closed laboratory at the University of Wisconsin, James Thompson and his colleagues are busy culturing human stem cells. Each of these stem cells, potentially immortal, has a complete human genome, a complete set of instructions coded on all of its genes, instructions on how to make a human being. Coded on all its genes. Now what does that mean? What exactly is a gene? And how does it work? To understand more about the revolution in biology and in society that many think will almost certainly make the 21st century the century of biotechnology, let's first take a look at the history of how we found out about genes. From very early times, people understood that sex was needed to produce offspring in many animals. They didn't think it was necessary for all, however. Aristotle, the Greek philosopher and scientist, Consider the greatest authority on science for over a thousand years said that worms and flies and such were spontaneously generated out of muck and slime. No sex needed, no parents required. But even when parents were obviously involved, no one had any idea what it was that made offspring resemble their parents, nor what it was that made them a little different too. In other words, no one had any idea how heredity worked. Well, today, we do know how heredity works. We know what it is that makes offspring resemble their parents. It is genes. And this is the story of how humans found out about genes, and the story of how genes work in our living world today. The first real scientific insight into heredity came about the time of the American Civil War, here in Brune, in the Czech Republic. The breakthrough was made by an eccentric Catholic monk named Gregor Mendel. Mendel was a busy man. He smoked 20 cigars a day, kept 50 hives of bees and many cages of mice. He was regional weather correspondent for the Austrian Empire. He was elected abbot of his monastery, and he carefully nurtured and studied thousands of garden pea plants. For this last task, the world is forever in his debt. See, up until Mendel's time, even educated people thought that inheritance was somehow carried by the blood. They thought that offspring were a blend of the qualities of their parents. They even thought that if a man had a tattoo on his right arm, his child might also be born with a tattoo on his right arm. Mendel's work with garden peas proved all these beliefs to be mistaken. Inheritance, he showed, was not carried by blood or any other general body cells of plant or animal. Instead, it was carried by some kind of special something that was hidden in the sexual cells, the egg and the sperm cells. These special somethings were later given the name genes. Well, here's how Mendel did it. In his monastery garden, he experimented. He took the male cells of peas that produced tall stem plants, for instance, and crossed them with the female cells of peas that produce short stem plants. To his surprise, from this cross, Mendel ended up not with a blend of tall and short stems, but with all tall stems. 100% tall stems. Well, what had happened to the short stem trait? It had not blended. Had it been lost, Mendel did another experiment. He took the tall plants that he got from crossing tall and short ones, 
called now the hybrid first-generation plants, and he crossed them with each other. Lo and behold, this time, the second generation, he did get some short-stem plants. In fact, on the average, one-fourth of the new pea plants turned out to be short-stemmed ones, and three-fourths turned out to be tall. And Mendo got these same ratios when he tried six other simple characteristics. Wrinkled and smooth seeds, axial and terminal flower buds, green and yellow seeds, yellow and green cotyledons, inflated and constricted pod shapes, and gray and white seed coats. Some thought Mendel a little odd to spend so much time counting seeds. And when he published his results in the Proceedings of the Brun Society in 1866, it did not make much of a splash. In fact, it was not until 40 years later, long after Mendel was dead, that the scientific world did take notice. And today, all biologists agree that Mendel's discoveries are indeed basic laws of heredity, valid not only for garden peas, but for elephants, for worms, for swordfish, and for humans. And after Mendel, progress was still slow in learning more details of heredity, and there was backsliding. Despite Mendel's work, the great pioneer of evolution theory, Charles Darwin, still believed in blending. He also thought that traits picked up in the lifetime of plants and animals could be inherited through what he called gemules in the body cells of plants and animals. As late as 1899, a student of biology at Brun found Mendel's 1866 paper and eagerly showed it to his professor. Oh, I know all about that paper. It's of no importance, said the professor. It's pure Pythagorean stuff. Don't waste your time on it. See, one of the problems was that investigators were too ambitious. People like Francis Galton in England, for instance, carried out scores of ingenious studies on the inheritance of complex human traits like intelligence, size, and bodily strength. Galton even tried to develop a numerical scale for beauty and love, and once did a statistical study of disasters on ships that carried missionaries versus those that did not. All of these complex traits and happenings we know today are due to a bewildering combination of thousands of genes and even more thousands of environmental factors. Around the turn of the century, botanists were independently finding Mendel's laws to be true. One far-seeing German scientist, August Weissmann, was already predicting in 1885 that heredity would eventually be found to be carried by definite chemical and above all, molecular structures. It remained for the 20th century to discover just what that molecular structure is. The most dramatic breakthrough in heredity since Mendel's garden happened here along the banks of the Cam River in Cambridge, England in the 1950s. A quiet young American biologist and former quiz kid from Chicago James Watson, used to stroll along this path with an English biologist in his mid-thirties, famous for his loud voice and even louder laugh, Francis Crick. Crick said of Watson, he was the first person I had met who thought the same way about biology as I did. And Watson said of Crick, he was the brightest person I had ever worked with. Along this path, in a tiny office at nearby Cavendish Lab, and over long luncheons at the Eagle Pub, Crick and Watson puzzled about what genes were and how they worked. The place, the time, the spirit, all were ready, and the sparks from the combination led to the greatest revolution in biology since that of Charles Darwin's theory of natural selection a hundred years before. You see, by the 1950s, much more was known about cells and about the Mendelian laws of heredity. T.H. Morgan at Columbia University and Herman Muller at Indiana University had used fruit flies to locate genes on the chromosome. They had shown how Mendelian laws still apply, but in a more sophisticated way than Mendel imagined. Muller, in particular, had shown how X-rays can cause mutations, that is, permanent changes, on a chromosome or on a gene. He was able to construct full-scale maps of the genes on the chromosomes of a fruit fly. 
A few decades later, geneticists would be able to do the same with human genes and chromosomes. One of the most important keys in this progress was new and better scientific equipment. Microscopes, for instance, have become much more powerful. Using new X-ray diffraction techniques, scientists could peek into the actual molecular structure of large molecules. And new chemical techniques were invented. Chromatography, electrophoresis, radioactive tracing that could separate and identify unbelievably tiny amounts of complex chemicals. Each of these advances required the thought and work of many hundreds of researchers. So it is misleading and unfair to single out one or two to get all the credit. And so too with the discovery of the molecular structure of genes that is now usually credited to the famous Crick and Watson team. Well, the particular tools that Watson and Crick used to make the breakthrough were model building, some recent x-ray data, and inspired guesswork. The principles needed for the model building had been worked out across an ocean and a continent by the chemist Linus Pauling at the California Institute of Technology in Pasadena. The x-ray data had come from the work of two scientists in London, Rosalind Franklin and Maurice Wilkins. The guesswork was their own. Later, three of the four received the Nobel Prize for the brilliant answer they gave to the question of what a gene is and how it works. Sadly, the fourth, Rosalind Franklin, died a premature death from cancer in 1958, two years before the Nobel Prizes were awarded. But what exactly did Crick and Watson do? Well, they figured out the architecture of a very large molecule, deoxyribonucleic acid, DNA for short. This molecular structure was so important because it is DNA in the nucleus of all cells that is the actual physical thing that carries the all-important information of heredity. The special something that Mendel had assumed in pea plants the molecule that Weissman had predicted in 1885, and the gene that Muller had mapped on fruit fly chromosomes. DNA is the physical molecule that carries the computer-like code that tells your cells how to make an eye an eye, an arm, a brain, and not just any eye, any arm, any brain, but your eye, your arm, and your brain. Not just you, but your dog, your goldfish, your poison ivy, your earthworm, the largest whale in our ocean, and the smallest virus in our bloodstream. All living things, in other words, are built and operated following instructions from the DNA in their cells. And Crick and Watson could now diagram and make models of the very most secret heart of life itself. Now here is the actual diagram Crick and Watson drew for their famous paper a structure for deoxyribose nucleic acid, published in the scientific journal Nature, April 25, 1953. DNA, they guessed correctly, was a double helix structure. The helix backbone was always the same, a well-known chemical group called phosphate sugar. Connecting the two phosphate sugar ribbons are pairs of four well-known chemical bases, called guanine, cytosine, adenine, and thymine. To a chemist, it was simplicity itself, and an elegant, beautiful simplicity, especially when they saw that guanine can only connect to cytosine, and adenine can only connect to thymine. Yet, despite that limitation, the helix is long enough so that an almost infinite number of possible sequences is possible, which means, of course, that an almost infinite variety of life forms is possible. And finally, as Crick and Watson said in their famous paper, it has not escaped our attention how this double helix structure provides powerful hints as to its method of replication within the cell. Well, in part two of this program, we will show how simply that replication works. An elegant, beautiful solution to an age-old puzzle. Now, just finding the actual molecular structure of DNA did not in itself solve all the problems of genetics. It did provide, however, the most powerful tool yet found to investigate these problems. 
Now scientists could isolate the parts of the cell that were the sites of the actual physical genes. They could proceed to take these genes apart and put them back together again, in old ways and in new ways. And today, in laboratories all over the world, geneticists and biochemists are making rapid progress in deciphering life's codes in many plants and animals, including humans. Synthetic genes have been made, genes have been spliced from one organism into another, genes have been repaired, genes have been mutated. Genetic surgery is now widely used commercially as hundreds of new biotech companies are launched. And whole new kinds of life forms, especially new strains of bacteria, are being designed and made in the laboratory. New kinds of life forms engineered to do specific tasks like create hormones, antibiotics, vaccines, mine metals, clean up pollution, even build computers. And in one of the biggest scientific projects of all time, geneticists, biologists, and chemists have now completed the job of mapping all the DNA sequences, that is, all of the genes of the human species. This project was first led, fittingly enough, by James Watson himself. It was successfully completed almost exactly 50 years after that first breakthrough. Well, the past 50 years have indeed started a revolution in biology. In the next 50 years, we'll have their own surprises.